everyone, we are here and we are live. New Hope Radio coming your way through Facebook, through WARV.net and 1590 on the AM dial. If you want to get us on Facebook, go to New Hope Christian Church, Swansea Mass, Facebook, something like that. And uh, we'll pop up there somehow, some way, through the magic of technology. So we're glad that you're here today. We're going to wrap up our series entitled, The Kingdom of Heaven is Like. The last one I got for you. There's other messages Jesus gave, but we're going to move on to some new things next week. Okay? But today we're going to wrap it up with the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner, a landowner who went on a journey. And we'll see what that means to us. By the way, we're only a week away. A week away from our live outdoor passion play. Good Friday, 7 o'clock next week. Going to be a beautiful, oh, praying for good weather. Praying, praying, praying for good weather. Outside, right there, I'm looking at it right now, in the amphitheater. Beautiful place to put on a live performance. We're going to take over the whole thing. It's going to be very impacting. It really is. So 7 o'clock, Good Friday. Bring some friends. Bring non-Christian friends. Bring a lawn chair. You might want to just sit down for part of it and just relax and enjoy it and let the Spirit minister to you as we go through that last night of the Lord's life. Okay? So that's what's happening. I think we get that movie tonight, too, The Case for Christ, at the Showcase Cinema on Quaker Lane in Warwick. All right? So get out there. If you've got nothing to do tonight, or maybe if you've got something to do, but this is more important. Get out there and support the movie, The Case for Christ. Remember that book Lee Strobel wrote? Well, it's a movie at the Showcase Cinema, Quaker Lane and Warwick. That's tonight. What time? I don't know. You have to call the, call the, uh, the cinema. Okay? All right. Here we go. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went far away on a journey. Like I said, it's the last message in our series. Here's what we've seen so far. Let's have a memory test. We saw the kingdom of heaven is like leaven in dough. That Jesus can talk to the bakers. It's like wheat and tears growing in a field. He can talk to the farmers. It's like a dragnet taking in all kinds of fish. He can talk to the fishermen. It's like a treasure buried in a field. He can talk to people who, like, get lucky. <laughs> it's like a landowner who hired people all day long. He can talk to businessmen who own their own business. It's like a wedding. Oh, you can talk to people who are getting married. It's like seed in the soil. You can talk to more farmers. Okay. See, Jesus has a way of saying things and teaching things that, like, okay, everybody can relate to. Everybody, the common working man, could relate to the things that Jesus said. Okay? Today, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went on a journey. And here's what I want us to see, that this particular parable, it's about our accountability and about the deity of Christ. We've got two themes woven into this parable, our accountability and Christ's deity. Okay, now we find it in Luke chapter 20, in verse 9, Jesus tells the story. A man planted a vineyard and rented it out to vine growers. And he went on a journey for a long time. At the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers so that they, they would give him some of the produce of the vineyard. But you know what the, the vine growers did? <laughs> they beat up the slave and they sent him away empty handed. That's a nice how do you do. Well, the landowner, he proceeded to send another slave. You know what they did? They beat him up too. And they treated him shamefully. And they sent him away empty-handed. Man. Well, you know what the landowner did? For the third time, he sent another slave. This one, they also beat him up and they cast him out. The owner of the vineyard, he's getting kind of tired of this now. <laughs> so are the slaves. And he said, oh, what shall I do? I know. I'll send my beloved son. I mean, he's my son. they got to respect him. But when the vine growers saw him, 
they reasoned with one another, saying, Ah, oh, this is the heir. Let's kill him, so that the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard, and they killed him. Wow, what an ending. Now, when Jesus told this parable, he was talking about himself. Here's the characters in the story. The vineyard is the nation of Israel. The tenants are the rulers of Israel, the, the guys that rented the vineyard and they're growing grapes. The messengers or the slaves, they're the prophets. And then the son, when he came, the heir, that's Jesus himself. And what makes this parable so powerful is that Jesus told this parable four or five days before the cross. Perhaps trying to get the religious leaders to see that he truly was the Son of God. Maybe that's what the, that was the point there. Open your eyes, men. In Luke chapter 20, verse 1, it tells us why he told the parable. On one of the days while he was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders confronted him. And they spoke to him, saying, Tell us by what authority you're doing these things. Who's the one who gave you authority? <laughs> it's like, okay, who gave them authority? The parable is about Jesus and the authority that he has. I would say that the power that Jesus had to work miracles, that was pretty good authority. That obviously came from God. So this is why he told the story of the vineyard and the landowner who went away on a long trip to show who he was. He was the Son of God, and he did have the authority of God. So, you know, this was a true-to-life situation. A man invests his money into a vineyard. He rents it out to people to farm it. In return, he would get a share of the crops, and they would keep the rest. And this was something that they all agreed on. And then the owner would go away on a long journey. He trusted the tenants to do what was right with the vineyard and to grow grapes. And at harvest time, he would send a messenger to collect his share of the grapes. But in this particular story, instead of giving the landowner his share, the tenants beat up the messenger and they sent him away. And like we read, he sent another messenger and they beat him up and sent him away. And he did it a third time and they did the same thing. What would you do if you were the landowner? Well, the landowner said, okay, I know what I'll do. I'll send my son. He's got authority. He represents me. He's the heir of the vineyard. They'll listen to him. But when he showed up, the tenants figured, hey, here's the son. If we get rid of him, we can keep the vineyard. So they killed the son. The owner of the vineyard, now I want you to get this very, very carefully. The owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. Did you get that? You see, Jesus is telling a story and he's saying, the father said, or the landowner said, yeah, I will send my beloved son. Oh, did you ever hear that before? My beloved son. Do you think these guys, these priests, in the audience that confronted Jesus and said, by what authority do you do these things? Do you think they ever heard, this is my beloved son? Remember the Jordan River and the baptism of Jesus? And there's Jesus down in the water with John and people lining the banks of the river. And Jesus goes in to be baptized and a voice comes from heaven, booming, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So here we are, three years later, and Jesus tells a story, and the Father says, I will send my beloved Son. And you think those Pharisees would have like, hey, wait a minute, we heard that before. Oh, maybe there is something to this Jesus. Wow. No, they didn't get it, no. 
See, you only get it when you want to get it. There are people that don't want to get it. And you know what? They never will. If you don't want to understand, you'll never understand. If you do want to understand, you will understand. Let me bring you some current events. I mean, it's all over the news today. Everybody's seen it. Um, the president bombed an airport in Syria yesterday. And most people are saying, you know, it, it's a good thing to do because we have to stop the annihilation of innocent men, women, and children, especially with chemical gas. So last night I'm watching the news about 11, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, different times, 9, 9.30. And um, I said, I'm going to put on the liberal stations, you know, MSNBC, CB, um, uh, what's the, uh, uh, the MSNBC and uh, CNN. I'm going to see what they have to say. They, they were like the Pharisees with Jesus. They couldn't come up with anything positive to say. They ripped apart every little thing about that event. And the point that I'm making, and I'm making this comparison with the Pharisees, and what I'm saying is, those who want to understand will. And those who don't want to understand won't. Those that hate somebody will never find anything good to say about that somebody. That's the way it goes. So, you know, they'll never say anything good about the president because they hate him. And people that hate always say negative things. Isn't that the work of the devil? So, again, let's bring it back. Jesus tells the story. The farmer, the father, said, I will send my beloved son. Did you get that, Pharisees? I'm going to send my beloved son. That's taken from Matthew 3.17, where the voice came out of heaven. This is my beloved son, in whom I well pleased. You know what this tells me? How important it is to remember what you hear. You know, when you go to church, you don't go to church, to church, to church just to listen. You go to <laughs> remember. Listening by itself is no good. You've got to remember. You've got to remember what you've heard. And then you'll have a benefit. But if you walk out and you forget everything you heard, it's like, oh, I never went. Why go? It's about remembering. The Pharisees did not remember. I'm sure some of these guys are at the Jordan River. Oh, yeah. And they heard the voice of God. This is my beloved son. But they forget. You know why? Because when you hate someone, you never remember anything good about them. I hope you and our audience don't hate anybody. It's not the Christian way. So in verse 14, when the vine growers saw him, they reasoned with one another. They said, hey, this is the year. Let's kill him. And then we'll get, the, we'll, we'll get the vineyard. And you know, in those days, Jewish law provided that a piece of property unclaimed by an heir would be declared ownerless. And it could then be claimed by others. So the tenants figured, hey, if the son is the heir and he's out of the picture, the property is ownerless, we'll step in and we'll claim it and we'll own it and it'll be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. And Jesus asked the question, what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? What would you do? Well, like the other parables Jesus told, they were based on true-to-life events. People really did rent out their farms and their vineyards to other growers, and they would expect a percentage of what was grown. But Jesus, he began the parable, and the people were shaking their heads in agreement, like, yeah, that's right, yeah, we see this all the time. We see landowners renting out their vineyards to the workers, and he goes away, and at harvest time he comes back, and you know the workers give him his cut, and they keep the rest, and they sell the grapes, and everybody's happy. But in this story, something shifted. And the people were getting the meaning of the story. It was about them. 
<laughs> Imagine hearing a story, you think it's about somebody else, and then the punchline, boom, it's about you. That's like, wow. That's like when, when Nathan told a parable to David about the guy's one sheep, and how a guy had a lot of sheep, but he took this man's one sheep and killed it and ate it. And David said, that dirty rat, let it be done to him. And Nathan said to David, you're the guy. Like, wow, what a wake-up call. You're the guy. So, Jesus said, here's what's going to happen. The landowner will come. Oh, he'll destroy those vine growers. And he'll give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, may it never be. May it never happen. But it happens. And what does the parable teach us? It teaches us something about man, and it teaches us something about God. What does it teach us about man? It teaches us human privilege. That the tenants didn't make the vineyard, they didn't clear the land, they didn't purchase the plants. They didn't do anything. It was already available to them. When Mark recorded the story, he added, a man, oh, planted a vineyard, then he put a wall around it, then he dug a vat under the wine press, and then he built a tower, and then he rented it out to the vine growers and went on a journey. So the landowner did all the work. He made everything ready for these growers to go to work. And he didn't stand over them. He didn't watch them. He went away and left them to their work. So what Jesus is saying is, listen, God has provided everything. God has given everything that we need. It also teaches about human sin. They refused to give the owner what was due him. They wanted to control everything. They said, no, man, we're not given to God. We're in control here. We're in control. You know, religion is like that. Religion seeks to control people. I remember being in Africa a few times, and the mosque every so many hours would blur out these sirens. It was a call to prayer. And if you were Muslim, you had to stop what you were doing and you had to pray. You know what that? That is control. And a lot of religions have control. Even, even in some realms of Christianity, there's control. They control what you eat, what you drink, what you wear, what you sing. It's all, it's all religious. Christianity is about life. It's not about control. Jesus said the, the thief... He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that they might have life and have it more, oh, abundantly. Super abounding life. This parable also teaches human responsibility. For a long time, the tenants were left alone. But the day of reckoning came. See, and even today we think, oh, you know, because God's coming is so far away, so we think, it's, we don't even think about it. Sooner or later, we are called upon to give an account for that which was committed to our charge. Sooner or later, every non-believer will stand before the judgment of the great white throne and receive their sentence. And every believer will stand before the Bema Seat judgment and receive their rewards or lack of rewards based on how faithful they were to what God had given them to do. Okay? So that's what it teaches about man. It teaches that man is responsible that man has sin, and that man has been privileged by God because God has provided everything man needs. Now, it also teaches about God. That what? God is patient. I mean, think about it. In this parable, the owner gave the tenants three opportunities to get right. Actually, four. The first slave, the second slave, the third slave, then his son. Four opportunities to get right. That's a lot of patience. That's why Peter could say, you know, the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight, that's Noah's family, were brought safely through the water. So, you know, God gave people 120 years to repent and they didn't repent. That's how long it took to build the ark. Peter later on said, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, where's the sign of his coming? 
When's Jesus coming? Where is he? He's waiting for more people to repent. He's waiting for more people to wake up, to come to their senses like the prodigal son did. He's waiting for people to come out of the pig pen and come back home to God. That's what he's waiting for. Not only does it teach us that God is patient, it also teaches us that God is judge. Here come the judge. He's coming. He does settle accounts with them. He doesn't just, oh, okay, they didn't mean it. We'll just forget about it. No, he settles accounts with people. No one, and I mean no one, should think that they are on a free ride with God in this life. There's no free rides. We are accountable even for the words that we speak. And with all that God has provided for us, hey, there will be a day of reckoning. And I shudder when I think about it. I think about my own day of reckoning. Oh, God, be, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's my prayer. And the sooner we quit griping and mur murmuring and get at God's plan, you know what? The better off we'll be. Really. We need to be with the plan of God. ASAP. And the better off you'll be. Then the last thing the parable teaches us is something about Jesus. You know what it teaches us? That Jesus knew his destiny. He knew his mission. And there was no turning back. You know, here we are, Palm Sunday this week. By the way, we're going to have a wonderful service. Palm Sunday, we're handing out palms too. As a reminder of what Palm Sunday is. But you know, here's the funny thing. For most people, Palm Sunday is a celebration. But you know what? For Jesus, it wasn't. To those that are informed, Palm Sunday is not really a celebration. And we're going to talk about that Sunday. 9 and 11 a.m. right here in New Hope, Route 6, Swansea, Mass. Come on out. If you want to get the real understanding of Palm Sunday, that's going to be our theme this week. 9 and 11 a.m. right here at New Hope. But Jesus knew his destiny. He came riding in on that donkey into Jerusalem, and he knew what was waiting for him. Even though the people had a different idea, oh no, he knew what was going to happen. And Jesus, being um, symbolized by the sun in the parable, knows that he's going to die. Secondly, he never doubted God's ultimate victory. He knew the cross and he knew the grave could not keep him down. He knew he would die on the cross, but he knew he would be raised again. Because he told the disciples, in three days the Son of Man will rise again. Don't you go fretting now. I'm coming back. I'll be back. He's the first one to say that, you know. Arnold Schwarzenegger stole it from Jesus. Jesus said it 2,000 years ago. I'll be back. And he was. So, even though he went to a horrific death, he knew he would have the ultimate victory and that the Father would give him the victory. We have to remember that too. That God, our Father in heaven, yeah, he gives us the victory as well. Jesus said in Matthew 20 that they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge him, that's the Romans, and crucify him. And he didn't stop there. On the third day, He'll be raised up. But you see, the disciples didn't hear that part. They shut down when they heard, oh no, he's going to die. How, how quickly we shut down when we hear something we don't like and we don't hear the whole thing out. They should have heard the whole thing out, but they didn't. And even when the lady said he wasn't in the tomb, they didn't believe him. They didn't believe the ladies. Not till they saw Jesus in his resurrected form did they finally believe. The third thing the parable teaches is that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. He did. There's his deity. He removed himself from the line of the prophets in the parable and singled himself out as the Son. Remember we said the slaves represented the prophets? But then the landowner said, oh, now I'll send my son. This is like a higher office. The Son is higher than the prophets. So he singled himself out from all the rest. So there's no excuse on the part of the tenants. They knew who the son of the landowner was. They knew. 
But Jesus talked about them. He said, What then is this that is written? And it was a prophecy. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. That's Christ. That's Christ. The cornerstones are the stones in the corner of a building where the walls connect and they interlock. If you take out the cornerstones, the building falls down. Jesus was the chief cornerstone. And yet the builders rejected him. You can't reject the structural part of a building. The building will fall down. They rejected the most important part of the building. So, what does this parable teach us? That we must be careful not to reject the most important part of life. What's the most important part of life? It's the Son of God. It's the Savior that God the Father sent into the world to atone for all of our sins, that we could be forgiven, that we could be accepted, that we would never perish, and that we would have ever lasting life. Let me tell you something. It doesn't get much simpler than that. Unlike, there's no excuse. What's your excuse for rejecting God's gift of His Son? It better be a good one, because you know what? There are no good ones. Just realize that God has a plan, and we're part of that plan. And the kingdom of heaven it's available to everybody, but it's not going to be realized by everybody. It's those who recognize Christ will realize heaven. See, so now we're back to those that want to understand will, those that don't, won't. Have a great day. New Hope Radio is on the radio tomorrow at 3. And don't forget Sunday morning, 9 and 11 a.m. right here for Palm Sunday. Have a great weekend.